Only China and the United States have big tech. Europe, Britain, nothing, zero. We are irrelevant. I know it's very harsh to say that, but Britain and the, United, the European Union um, better understand that this, these Brexit discussions and all that stuff that has been occupying us now for the last seven years has rendered us irrelevant without cloud capital. Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Krishnan Guru Murthy and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. My guest this week is the Greek economist Yanis Varoufakis. He was, briefly in 2015, the Greek finance minister during the height of the debt crisis. He has been involved in electoral politics in his own country. He has campaigned around Brexit and been very involved with the Labour Party in this country. Uh, But he recently lost his parliamentary seat himself. He is the author of many books and his latest is called Techno-Feudalism, What Killed Capitalism? Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, let's go through this very simply. I mean, first of all, feudalism. By feudalism, I imagine uh, medieval peasants who are effectively forced to live on the land of their lords and masters. They give him a, uh, a slice of their, their produce or their Rent. income, yes. and they are basically bound to him and, uh, and have no freedom. Is that what you mean by feudalism? That's what we mean by feudalism, but not by (laughs) techno-feudalism. So what is techno-feudalism? I'm glad you started with feudalism because the great transformation which has created the modern world was the one from feudalism to capitalism. As you correctly put it, feudalism was a socio-economic system predicated upon land and land ownership. So the aristocracy owned the land, it got a lot of economic, social, political power. It was all one thing back then. There was no distinction. If you had political power, you had economic power, unlike under capitalism. And the wealth uh, was transferred to the ruling class, to the aristocracy, through, as you put it, rent, taking a slice of the produce, of the harvest of the peasants who didn't labor for a wage. There was no labor market. You couldn't quit. You didn't receive a wage. You just kept that which the landlord or the sheriff operating on the landlord's behalf uh, would leave behind after the harvest was in. Then you had a fantastic transformation, the great transformation, as Karl Polanyi put it, from feudalism to capitalism. Power shifted from those who owned land to those who owned the machines, the steam engines, the factories, the steamships, the telegraphs, the later on electrical power generating systems. And Wealth came from accumulation, not of rents, but of profits. So you had commodification of land. Suddenly land became a commodity when the enclosures chucked out of the land, the peasants, and replaced them with sheep, if you remember, of course you remember. Uh, And this is the beginning of the modern world, of modernity as we know it. Now, what am I saying with techno-feudalism? I'm saying that capital triumphed so magnificently that it mutated, it created a mutant version of it, which I call cloud capital. So what is the difference between cloud capital and normal capital? Take an industrial robot. That's traditional capital. It's very snazzy, it's very technologically advanced, it moves its own, it's got electronics in it, software and all that. But it does more or less the, the same job that the steam engine did. It automates production in the factory. Cloud capital is this network of machines and software which allows us to talk to one another, big tech. My hypothesis is that this new version of capital, cloud capital, is a very different beast from industrial robots and steam engines. And anyone who owns it owns effectively a new form of digital land. Think of Amazon.com. It's like a cloud thief. It's a thief that lives in the cloud effectively on a bed of cloud capital, which allows the new lord, Jeff Bezos, or whoever owns that particular piece of digital land, to charge rents. Because Jeff Bezos doesn't produce anything that you buy on Amazon, same with the owners of Alibaba and so on. What they do, however, do is they charge 40%. Think about it, 40% is a gigantic rent 
on the price of everything that is sold to you on Amazon.com. Now, this is not a theoretical point. My point, the point I'm trying to make in the book, is that this is a great transformation, which is, if you come to, if you put your mind to it, it explains the reason why we have so much anxiety in the world. We have this poly crisis. Uh, the crisis of today is nothing like the crisis of the 1970s, even the cost of living crisis. The inflation we have today bears no resemblance to the inflation that we experienced in the 1970s. Uh, you had a period of deflation, a period of inflation. You have this gigantic disconnect between the amount of money in the economy we never had so much money as we have now, globally speaking, across the West or the whole world. And yet investment is at the lowest level in proportion to how much money there is in the economy. And I do believe the answer lies in this fantastic transformation, very violent transformation of our world from capitalism to something that I call techno-feudalism, which is, of course, based on enormous quantities of capital, unlike the older version of feudalism that you described. So there's a lot to unpack there. So, so in, in terms of um, you know the, the analogy of rent and mm. the who are the serfs? Are the serfs all of us, or are they? You know, who is paying the rent? Is it the is it the makers of the goods that Amazon is selling, or or, or what? The rents themselves are paid by the capitalists. So if you're producing a bicycle or a, a book, and you sell it through Amazon, through Alibaba, through a myriad of such uh, platforms, now doing amazing business in Indonesia, in Africa. It's not just a Western phenomenon, right? Of course, in China. Uh, if you are producing stuff, stuff, material goods or services or movies, you sell them through that kind of cloud feed and you pay rent. For the very first time in the history of humanity, Capital is being produced or reproduced by people who are not being paid as wage laborers. So every time you post uh, a review on Amazon, uh, you walk around London or drive around London with your phone, and the phone is pinging Google Maps where you are. And producing so, data. So, so Google Maps becomes more valuable because it can predict congestion. So you are contributing to the capital of these large conglomerates without being a paid laborer. I call that a cloud surf. Now, interestingly, I was, when I was researching this book, uh, I discovered that on average, conglomerates of the old capitalist type pay about 80 to 85% of their revenues to workers. Facebook pays 1%. Now, why? Because Facebook, the capital of Facebook, is produced for free by everybody who creates their own pages, posts messages, and sends uh, reviews to one another, and so on. But, but and they this would, is all free labor. Yeah, but they would say this is not labor. This is not people working for us. It is This work. is people getting a, a product by choice. No one's forcing mm. them to do it. They are choosing to use the the, the platform that Facebook um, is, or, or you know, whichever platform you might be talking about. Um, and they are getting a convenience out of it. They're getting a service from sure. that. But that's irrelevant. It is true that people do it voluntarily. I do it. I, I, I couldn't live without my phone, with my, without my TikTok, without my... I'm, I'm, I'm an addict yeah. as well. Right? So are they I volunteer. I volunteer. You know, but voluntary serfdom is the worst kind of serfdom. But anyway, this is not an ethical point I'm making. It doesn't matter whether you're forced or we are not forced. The fact is that you're doing a lot of work. You know, all these kids with you know, uploading TikTok videos. They love it. You know, if you took it away from them, yeah. they would hate you, especially if you're a parent, as I am, and I'm sure you are. Uh, but nevertheless, the fact remains, they put a lot of work. They don't think of it as work, but it is work. And it is work that is replenishing the capital stock of TikTok. Now, that from a macro perspective is crucial because you have capital being reproduced without wage labor. Now, why is it important? Because wage labor means that there are wages that are being paid, and those wages contribute to the demand for things in the marketplace. When you have all this labor producing capital, but it is not remunerated, that shrinks aggregate demand macroeconomically. And what does that mean? It means that central banks cannot get away without printing more money 
to replenish the demand. But then, especially when you have an inflationary cost of living crisis as we do now, there is a clash of objectives on the one hand to arrest rising prices. But on the other hand, if you don't print the money, because you have so much work that is not remunerated, then aggregate demand is shrinking. This is why central bankers are in a state of apoplexy. They do not know what to do. They are damned if they do raise interest rates, and they're damned if they don't. So this is not a theoretical book, as from, from my perspective. It's an attempt to understand the world we live in, including at the micro level, at the level of our kids. My concern is also a concern that the liberal should have about the concept of the liberal individual, because if you think about it, once upon a time, there was a strict demarcation between work and play and leisure. And that's gone. And that is gone. And it is gone because if you're producing capital, even in your sleep, more, more or less, uh, if you are uh, in a society where, you know, I've been a professor for many years before I got into politics, I noticed that young people now are constantly angst-ridden about their social media. Why? Because they know that when they apply for a job, the interviewing panel will look at their social media. So they are constantly trying to create the self which they think is going to sell in the labor market. Now, this is all happening subconsciously and voluntarily, but it means that there is no autonomy of the liberal individual anymore. It also means that we can have no social democracy. The social democratic parties are bunk. So you think in, the, in, in, in reality it is not really possible to opt out of all of this and just say, I'm not, I'm not doing it? It is possible, but you have to become a, a neo-Luddite. You've got to switch off the phone, get an old Nokia that cannot connect to the internet. I, I know people who do that, you know? but it's not an escape route for society. It may be an escape route for the individual, but it can't be an escape route for, for, for humanity. So, so what, why is this something that, I mean, why is this something that replaces capitalism rather than is just part of it? It depends on how you define capitalism. My definition of capitalism is a system that has two pillars. One is markets. Unlike feudalism, when we shifted from feudalism to capitalism, markets did all the work in terms of coordinating human activities. Everything is either sold through a market or purchased at the marketplace. So markets, one pillar of capitalism. The second is profits. What lubricates capitalism, what makes capitalism grow and continue and all that is profit making. If I'm right with my hypothesis in techno-feudalism, both are now gone. They're sideshows. Of course, there is profit. The profit motive is everywhere. Of course, there are markets everywhere. But they are optional now. Jeff Mezes does not make his money out of profits. He collects rents. Uh, Isn't that the same thing? No. It's exactly the opposite. Uh, the reason why capitalism was such a major advancement or such a revolutionary change from feudalism was because of the shift from rents that were collected for no productive effort and no, for, for no entrepreneurial activity of the aristocrats to profits. Jeff Bezos is, of course, a brilliant entrepreneur in creating this digital landscape over which he has monopoly property rights, which he uses to collect the rents. So that, that is macroeconomically very significant because of the depressing effect on aggregate demand, which is then replaced by central bank money. And it's also hugely significant from th the perspective of your question, because if markets have been replaced by these digital fiefs, digital fiefdoms, and profits have been replaced by rents, then that's not capitalism anymore. And now, of course, you could say, oh, come on, Yanis, let's call it, you know, platform capitalism or rentier capitalism. Would that be wrong? No, it would not be wrong. In the same way, however, that it wouldn't be wrong for Adam Smith not to refer to the new capitalist system as capitalist, but to refer to it as an industrial, profit-driven feudalism. By dropping the word feudalism mm. in the early 19th century, intellectuals, especially in Britain at the time, helped us understand that this was a big thing. It was a great transformation. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to alert people to the fact that we have a very different world now, where the laws of society that prevailed before 2010, 2015, 2020, no longer prevail. And this is why central banks 
That's why governments, that's why um, world leaders, that's why you know, globalization is now in tatters. So, I mean, it's, it's easy to understand the analogy when you look at Amazon or mm. um, you know, one of those sort of uh, platforms. Um, it's a bit harder, I suppose, when you start looking at X or Facebook to understand, um, you know, quite, quite the same analogy or even, you know, car companies. Because, you know, ultimately, mm. isn't a car company like Tesla or, or any other electric car company, a data-driven kind of car company, just the product that we buy and use? You know, it's got, it's got a data element to its value. Uh-huh. But isn't it actually just kind of the same old thing? Nope. What's the difference between Tesla? and Volkswagen. Volkswagen are now the mighty German company. They are shifting towards electric cars. So one might have thought that, okay, so Volkswagen has copied Tesla, it's another Tesla. It ain't. Why? Because there's no cloud capital in Germany. Volkswagen has no access to cloud capital. Why do you think Elon Musk bought Twitter and turned it into into X? Tesla's increasingly like all electric cars, BYDs from China and so on, the value added, the surpluses, the profits, the money that comes out of producing these things is increasingly going to shift from, from, from fine engineering, because electric cars don't have that much engineering no. involved in them, right? Uh, to the cloud, to cloud capital. Volkswagen doesn't have access to that. That is why the German business model is uh, collapsing. That is why the Germans themselves, the German industries themselves, are in a state of panic. Because they know that even if they just copy Tesla completely and create a Tesla, they do not, Germany has failed. Only China and the United States have big tech. Europe, Britain, nothing, zero. We are irrelevant. I know it's very harsh to say that. But Britain and the, United, the European Union um, better understand that this, these Brexit discussions and all that stuff that has been occupying us now for the last seven years has rendered us irrelevant without cloud capital. So what, what is the, what is the sort of the, the democratic response or what is the right response to this? Let me tell you what I don't think the solution is. Social democracy cannot do it. So a social democratic solution is bunk. We need to socialize cloud capital. Cloud capital must be socialized. In other words, it must belong to the people who actually produce it. And Jeff Bezos is not the one who's producing it. How? Let me give you a couple of examples because this is a very, very long conversation in itself. Imagine that we changed corporate law such that every employee gets one share the moment they are employed. Shares cannot be traded and they cannot be leased. So in the same way that you have one vote during an election, political election, whether it's local government or national government or European parliament election, you cannot trade it, you cannot lease it. Like a student card when you enter university. You get it courtesy of being a worker, an employee. So the value doesn't go up or down because it can't be traded. it can't be traded. But it gives you a vote. And you can vote on any number of it, like you are a member, an equal member of the shareholders' uh, communion. Imagine how that would change the world. A real overnight. shareholder democracy. It's, it's a real shareholder. Right. Exactly. So you, you can, a democracy is extended to the corporation. It doesn't mean that the state has taken over the companies. It's a completely market-based system still, except you, you drop two markets. The two really problematic markets under capitalism and now techno-feudalism. The share market, because they can, you can't buy and sell shares, so it goes. Don't even need to buy, buy it. It simply shrivels and dies. And secondly, the labor market. Because suddenly there's no di- difference between being a worker and being an owner. So there's no difference between profit and wages. So yeah, I worked for a company like that in, in, in Washington State, in the United States, um, 10 years ago. It was fascinating to watch it work. Uh, a very successful company, a company, company comprising 350 employees, with $1.2 billion turnover a year. So it's not, this. I'm not talking about some kind of Robert Owen commune in the 19th century Victorian era. Well, I mean, suppose, okay, suppose, suppose let, let's sort of jump all the steps that it would require to get you there, you know, whether mm-hmm. it was a, a revolution yeah. or a, whatever it might be that might get you there. Do you honestly think that 
most people would want to take those sorts of decisions around the companies that they work for. Yes, absolutely. People love to feel that they have the right. Because most participate. business decisions are quite complex. You know, they're not sure. sort of... But you see, that's why that experience of mine, that company, was important because it wasn't compulsory to participate in every vote. I mean, it would have, it would have been very inefficient if everybody voted on everything. Because, you know, there are some things you don't know much about and some other things you don't care about. So why should you vote on those? But it, 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 the way we were doing it was that, you know, you had the right to, to, to vote. There was a social contract, an implicit convention, a kind, you know, of ethical standard amongst us that you would only vote for things that you put some work into get, becoming informed about. Uh, you had per permanent access to intranet meetings when, for instance, you know, I, I wanted to employ a graphic designer. So in the context of this horizontal decision making, I put out a message to colleagues and said, you know, who, who, who thinks we should employ another graphic designer, an extra one, and who wants to form a search committee with me? And three or four people did. And then we interviewed people and it was video streamed, live streamed for anybody who cared to find out how these candidates were doing. And the idea was that at the end of the day, when those interviews were finished, those who actually you know, participated in the process, even simply by watching the interviews, would vote. And the rest would abstain if they hadn't have, you know, had the opportunity to form an opinion. It actually worked really very nicely. And that way, you know, people feel motivated to participate where they think they can help. And it, it is a far better management system than the top-down thing. I mean, let's talk about your own experience of politics and mm. elected politics. Um, I mean, we should really start at 2015 briefly. I mean, you know, you know, in terms of sort of, you suddenly have this huge amount of power in a sort of a crisis government, seemingly. No, no. No, no I was the most powerless politician in the history of Europe. <laughs> because remember, um, I was the finance minister of the most bankrupt state in the world. So that the only power you have is the power to veto, to veto loans that are being thrown your way. Why were they thrown our way, given that we were bankrupt? To cover up our bankruptcy, because the European Union did not want to admit to the fact that the member state of the Eurozone could go bankrupt. And because they didn't want the bankers to lose property rights over the banks, which went bankrupt on their watch. So it was like, you know, imagine you're walking down the street and there's a gang of thugs approaching you and you only have one weapon, but it happens to be a nuclear bomb. That's, that's how all it, you heard. That's how it felt. But when you look back at your own appointment to that position, do you think it was, do, I mean, do you think it was kind of wrong? You know, that it, was it sort of crony democracy in a way? You know, did you get this job because you're friends with... No, exactly the opposite. The one thing I'm proud of was that this was not one of those cases. I was not a politician. Uh, I had uh, become known because I was um, uh, warning Greek governments without wanting ever to be part of the political scene. I was warning that Greece had gone bankrupt. Please, please, please do not make the mistake of thinking that the solution is another huge loan on conditions of austerity that will deplete further our capacity to repay our debts. So I was elected because at some point the people of Greece had enough of this extending and pretending of one loan coming after the next, cover up our bankruptcy under conditions that were destroying the lives of 90% of the population and you know, sending uh, you know, one million out of 10% of the population, the young and the best educated abroad to migrate. To migrate. I mean, they, you know, London is full of them, right? Um, so uh, it, it, that was a brief moment when democracy worked. I'm not saying this be because I was the one that was elected, uh, but because I think that it is clear that the system, the, the media star system loathed me, uh, the, you know, the, the powers that be generally did not like my message. They don't like finance ministers saying that we're bankrupt and then it's a brace of bankruptcy and st instead of pretending that we can cover it up through loans. Uh, and I knew it was going to be a massive struggle. I thought there was this, a chance, a 20 to 30% probability of success if we stuck together. And by that, I mean, if the prime minister and I stuck together, the prime minister and I 
didn't stick together because our opponents, the creditors who were insisting on more predatory loans, managed to drive a wedge between us. And in the end, they won him over and he decided to surrender and take the loan and I left. What, what do you think has sort of gone wrong more recently for you in terms of sort of electoral politics? You know, you tried to sort of start a movement. It, it, it you know, it's just largely been rejected now, hasn't it? Yes, so absolutely. Why? We are the great losers. But both Tsipras, my former comrade and prime minister, and I, we are both the big losers. This reason is, I think, quite straightforward. When it comes to these matters, I think the, the simplest explanation is the best. It's Occam's razor. In 2015, we managed to convince 62% of the population, who were not left-wing, to believe in us, to rise up against every television channel, every oligarchic Rupert Murdoch-like newspaper, uh, all the banks, the European Central Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the European Commission, the whole system. They, the people, 62% of the population, backed us. We raised their expectations that we would be able to deliver them from this permanent debt bondage. And we failed. We failed. You know, sit, uh, voters out there, after a while, don't care whose fault it was. At some point, they said, you know, go away. You made us hope. That hope was betrayed. We don't care how and why. Go away. We'll go back to the sad politics of voting for the political leader or the party that uh, will perpetuate our debt bondage, but at least it will give us something. Something, you know, because we don't want to think about the crisis anymore. You know, the reason why our party, Mera 25, my party, uh, tanked was because we kept trying to tell people what we thought was the truth. So do you think that, because we talk a lot about the need for truth in politics yes. now, especially after the era of the populace. What do you offer people, truth or hope? Well, the question is, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, are, are you basically saying people, people can't handle the truth? No, no, people had enough. You know, people who rose up, trusted you, gave, gave you 62% of the vote and saw nothing come out of us. They say, can you please go away? <laughs> we, we know what the truth is. They, they don't want lies. They just don't want to hear from you, especially after you've been spat out by the system, to keep telling them things which they know to be true, which are painful, but which do not lead to the answer, so what do we do tomorrow? Yeah. Do you think that's why Labour doesn't talk about going back into the European Union? My view of this Labour Party is rather dim and grim. Keir Starmer uh, has zero credibility with anyone. He ran He's under the, the banner of Jeremy Corbyn, supposedly trying to make Jeremy, who's a personal friend of mine, full disclosure here, prime minister. Then he ran for the leadership of the Labour Party, saying that he will retain the 2019 manifesto intact and he will fight for its implementation. Then he ditches that manifesto. Uh, he promises that he's not going, not going to revisit Brexit. Now he talks about, effectively, the Norway solution, bringing Britain back to the single market. By the way, I campaign... I see, no, he, he says that's not an option. He says that's not even... Says, there's no he, case for it. He, he says, but, he, but at the same time, he says that he's going to maintain the alignment with the single market. Why would you ever do that unless you want to rejoin the single market? So he has absolutely zero credibility. But right now, right? I mean, Keir Starmer's way ahead in the polls. It does look like he's going to be the next prime minister, as things stand. And that may be because of your previous answer, which is that people may just be sick of this government. They've had enough. You know, they yeah. didn't deliver in their terms. Yeah. So you get rid of them and you try something else. So does it really matter whether you find him trustworthy or credible or whatever? He's probably going to be in power, isn't he? Of course, it doesn't matter what I think. <laughs> but you know, I'm but quite, that analysis does I'm that analysis matter? That. No, but you see, it doesn't matter whether he becomes prime minister or not, because he's going. I mean, I, I was. He's not going to have power anyway. Is what he's you're not saying. going to have power. He doesn't have. Uh, he doesn't have a spine either. So he, he uh, Sunak is spineless. Look at HS2. I mean, it is pathetic now that they are talking about stopping it at Birmingham. Next, they will stop it at Watford, right? Um, you might as well not do it if you're not going to do it. Uh, and so he's spineless. He's uh, crumbling under the pressure, the budget pressure. But so is Keir Starmer. If you can't come up with 
credible policies that you will stick to unless something catas- cataclysmic takes place, then it really doesn't matter whether Sunak or Keir Starmer is in power. This is the greatest defeat of democracy. It doesn't matter whether Sunak or Starmer is in power. So let's Because they're come, not in power anyway, they're in government. So, so let's come back to techno-feudalism yes. then. I mean, you, you've cited some examples of AI as very exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, so what, what, does, what does AI do to techno-feudalism? Does it sort of eat it? Or, or, no, or, or do the sort of the, 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 the feudal kings of the techno world one thing. Own it. Remember, artificial intelligence was not born yesterday. The algorithms that allowed Google to search the net for you, they're species of artificial intelligence. Now what we have is these uh, large language models which take AI to a higher level. But cloud capital is based on artificial intelligence. So it's one thing, it's not something else which is it's part of techno-feudalism. It's simply turbocharging te- techno-feudalism. Uh, but so that this is not too abstract a conversation, let me give you a vision of how I would like cloud capital to work. Imagine you wanted to to hail a cab or you know, to go somewhere in London, right? Now you have to use Uber or Lyft or one of those companies, uh, which essentially uh, uses you as a cloud surf because it uses your data, uh, and then it exploits proletarian labor who are driving for a pittance. Now imagine if you owned your own digital identity which you don't at the moment. At the moment, you, on the internet, you need either your bank or Google who use your credit card in order to, 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 to state to the rest of the internet users that you are who you say you are. Uh, but if you owned your digital identity, this was offered to you by the state. The state gave you a digital ID which identified you in the digital world, in the in cyberspace, and you were going to stand outside uh, Channel 4 and you say, Look, I'm, I'm, I want to go to Fulham Broadway. Who wants to bid for it? And you had countless different uh, outfits, all cops, working with, you know, their own AI bots, uh, even public transport. You get a message saying, you idiot, the tube is next door. It's faster for you to use it. And you choose, you know, which outfit will take you to Fulham Broadway. That is very similar to what we're doing now, but it is a world apart from an economic point of view, from an ethical point of view, from a sociological point of view to what we have. If you could change the world then in any way, how would you change it? I think that two things are absolutely crucial. One is to democratize the workplace in the way that we discussed before. One person, one share, one vote. And the second is for our central bank, the Bank of England in this country, to provide everyone with a free digital account and a PIN number, and then let Barclays and Lloyds find reasons to exist by offering you services other than the payment system. These two moves would really revolutionize the world we live in. Uh, They sound like relatively small moves. But the world we live in would not look the same if they were made. Yanis Varoufakis, thank you very much indeed for your time. Well, thank you.